1927, Charles Lindbergh electrified the world by flying solo from New York's Roosevelt Field to Le Bourget Airfield outside Paris, France. His flight triggered what was to become known as the Golden Age of Aviation, a period of intense experimentation and public interest that extended to the beginning of World War II. In spite of popular worldwide interest during this period, aviation was yet to make a political impact in America. Congress was preoccupied with the direction the nation's economy was headed. It had little interest in promoting aircraft development. While there were some large aircraft manufacturers, the cutting edge of aviation technology was often left to experimenters in small, struggling shops around the early 30s captured the imagination of millions. To this day, the image of the stubby little planes typifies that golden era. Unfortunately, over the years, aviation history writers have been unkind to the enthusiastic and talented men who produced some of the most remarkable aircraft ever built. Their sensational tales of hard luck, recklessness, and death have blurred the record of the Granvilles and their associates. What you are about to hear is the story of the GB airplanes, told by the people who were there. Starting with Jimmy Doolittle, the human bullet. The little plane belongs to the Springfield Air Racing Association, built by the Granville Brothers in Springfield. In the next few minutes, we expect to make an attempt on the world speed record. The story of the creative genius behind the GB racers begins in New England in the late 1920s. Zanford Granville, eldest of five brothers from a Madison, New Hampshire farming family, had moved to Boston several years earlier and started an automobile repair garage. Well, my older brother, Zanford, started the organization. He uh, started in the garage business. He was a very good mechanic and sort of a self-taught engineer. He had his uh, own garage business at the age of 19. He became interested in aviation soon thereafter, and uh, he started learning to fly at the East Boston Airport. And uh, he worked at the airport to pay for the flying time, and I believe he got his pilot's license uh, in 1925. Zanford had a flair for mechanical things, and he soon found himself repairing airplanes at the East Boston Airport. He then brought his, uh, my old, uh, next oldest brother, Tom, to uh, Massachusetts to take over the garage so he could spend full time at the airport. Soon thereafter, he formed a company at the airport, which was called Granville Brothers Air Service. Uh, I joined him in 1927. We built a shop on the field on a truck chassis so we could move around because we weren't permitted to build a permanent structure. And uh, we rented a basement of a shoe factory in which to do our major overhaul work. Now this went on for a year or two and we gained quite a bit of experience overhauling the airplane of that day and then decided that maybe we ought to build one of our own. Zanford set up shop with his four brothers and coined the GB logo which stood for the initials of Granville Brothers. Zanford was the guiding light and brought together an unusual array of talent. He marshaled the skills of his brothers and brought in top-notch engineering personnel to validate his creations. One of them, Bob Hall, was to play a pivotal role in the GB success. He, uh, he had been an engineer on Skyway's flying boat and uh, their boat was designed right in our office. We had a, we had a little office on Arlene Street in Boston in the corner of a abandoned the shoe factory which where well, we repaired airplanes and Skyways had these three young fellows all fresh out of college that were designing the boat in our building and we were building it. And that was uh, Bob Hall, Bob Air, and Bob Dexter. Zanford had little formal education beyond the eighth grade but was an intuitive engineer and worked well with Bob Hall. Zanford's innovative nature was evident from the very start 
in what was to become a continual string of improvements that would influence aviation design for decades. And uh, Sanford Granny, as we called him, designed this airplane, and uh, we tried to introduce a lot of things and fixes for things that uh, we felt were wrong with the aircraft of the day. And, Such uh, as? Well, for example, uh, this airplane had flaps to lower the landing speed. We had releasable controls so the pilot could release the controls from the student in flight with just a twist of the, the stick. Uh, it had brakes, steerable brakes. It had a tail wheel. The top and bottom wings were interchangeable. Uh, the attachment fittings on the fuselage and various critical areas were uh, equipped with universal joints to prevent uh, serious damage if a landing gear strut got bent. It wouldn't tear the fitting off the fuselage and a lot of things like that that we'd been repairing on other aircraft. We had a sliding stick arrangement in it so two people could sit side by side without having a stick between their knees and people used to fly in open cockpit in those days and uh, they could even use a robe in the winter time to keep from freezing to death <laughs> without interfering with the controls. On May 3rd, 1929, at 5.30 in the morning, the new biplane was rolled out of the hangar. We didn't want too many onlookers, so we assembled the airplane in the middle of the night and was ready to fly at 5.30 in the morning. And uh, Granny took it off and made a flight around the field. The weather was extremely bad, but we were ready to fly and flew anyway. And it was very successful. And uh, so then we started looking for a place to continue with our efforts with the hope to market the airplane. Boston papers reported the GB Model P as the first successful aircraft built in that city. In late spring of 1929, Bob Granville sent letters to various cities in New England, trying to find someone interested in backing the fledgling company. They received an invitation from the four Tate brothers in Springfield, Massachusetts, to attend an air meet during the July 4th celebration. George, Harry, Frank, and James Tate operated a successful ice cream manufacturing business and had recently opened the Springfield Airport. Granny's plane caught the fancy of Lowell Bales, a barnstormer and part-time airline pilot operating out of Springfield, who was known for his flying skills. Bales was quite impressed with the plane, but he felt it needed a bit more power. At the time, the ship was powered by a Veli 55-horsepower five-cylinder radial engine. A larger engine made a marked improvement, and based on Bales' enthusiastic endorsement, the Tates offered to finance Stanford if he would move his operation from Boston to Springfield. At the uh, time that we moved in, it was a, 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 the remains of a dance hall. It, it had a nice hardwood floor, which was nice to work on. It was just an open building. And uh, the first thing we did was set up a line shaft, supposed to have power to run the tools, and uh, brought some carpenters in and built some offices all along the front of it. And it started purchasing a few second-hand tools. Mindless of the worsening economic situation in the country, Granville Brothers Aircraft enthusiastically began building planes based on the Model P design. They hired Bob Hall from Boston and made him chief engineer. He set about preparing the Model P for certification by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Eight of the biplanes sold easily, and the little company was on its way. But their optimism was to come to an abrupt end. In November, the 1929 stock market crash came. The aviation industry was one of the hardest hit, at the time, airplanes were more a plaything of the rich. There was little interest in buying airplanes. Times were hard. I think this is what led us into the racing end of the business. Uh, at about that time, I think uh, early 30, 
we heard about the um, All American Derby. I think it was sponsored by the Cirrus Engine Company. There was quite a lot of money for the prizes involved, and some of us had been toying with the idea of building a small plane for a plaything anyway, and we went on with that to build a pl plane for this Cirrus American Derby. Hoping at a chance to win some of the prize money being offered, Bob Hall encouraged Granny to build a plane specifically for the Cirrus Derby. The Model X began to take form. Driven by a Cirrus 90 horsepower engine, the ship had a top speed of 140 miles per hour. Lowell Bales was chosen to fly the Model X, and everyone's hopes ran high. It was a long, really tough race, about uh, 55, I think it was 5,541 miles, they called it, and it was almost completely around the country, the United States. It was really, it could be called a reliability tour, couldn't it? Yes, it, uh, it, that was what it was really for, was to, pr to prove the reliability of Cirrus engines. Uh, Cirrus put up the money for the racing. And uh, quite a f there was quite a few standard airplanes in it, like great three or four Great Lakes biplanes, for instance. But uh, Command Air built a special airplane for it. Lee Gelbach in the Command Air finished first, but the GB Model X with Lowell Bales aboard finished second and first among a production airplane called the GB Sportster. The Command Air, but I guess it was kind of tough to fly too. When and uh, it was a little bit faster, I guess, than the GB. But they fought it out between them. They were the only. They were ahead of everybody else all through the race, both of them. Sometimes one ahead, and sometimes the other. I understand they were good friends. Go back and Oh Bales. yeah, yeah, they were excellent friends. Two mighty wonderful pilots. And Bales, Bales really advertised the GB quite a bit because every night when he came in to land, he. He would put on a little aerobatic show before he sat down. Gelback was usually too tired to do that. And I, I don't know whether he could have done it with a rocket that way or not, but... Oh, you mean as Bales hopped from city to city, he would do that? Yeah. Oh, every, uh, during every, the race, during the... the uh... Yeah, they had a schedule on from city yeah, to city to yeah. city, day by day. And when, when he came in to land, why well, he'd just come down to the oh. airport and roll her up over a few times. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> well... And that, that, you know, that really... A lot of people saw it and liked it. I know uh, when Bales returned, he landed at Westfield so that uh, the Springfield Flyers could come over and escort him home. That's right. And that really put the name GB in on the aviation map, don't you think? Yes, it did. Certainly did. Also Lowell Bales. Everybody knew Lowell Bales in the country after that. Were you able to sell the Sportsters? In other words, was there was there were there enough wealthy individuals to uh, well, keep you going? There was enough to sell a few. <laughs> uh, we uh, the first two uh, Bales bought the himself. Uh, he bought the the ship that he flew in the Derby. He he loved it, and but as soon as he got back, he acquired it, and then he joined forces with Roscoe Britton, and they they went on barnstorming tours all over the. East Coast and using that to draw the crowds with. Bales could even bring it in on its back and roll it and land it. <laughs> and that drew a crowd. And anywhere you drew a crowd, you, of course, uh, made more famous the name GB. Yeah. Everybody came to know what uh, they were. We, uh, at Boston, we took care of Harvard Flying Club's airplane and uh, two young fellows who who flew them a lot was George Rand and uh, Harold Moon, and they both came to Springfield and bought Sportsters immediately after that. So that, that was our first two production Sportsters. And these two fellows weren't from Springfield, so they took their Sportsters out of the Springfield areas. Yeah, right? Rand was from New York and Moon was from uh, Philadelphia. The inline Sportsters continued to evolve. Some fitted with Cirrus engines, others with the 125 horsepower Manasco. The Model D rolled out in 1931 and sported a fully fared landing gear which was to become standard on all future GB aircraft. But Granny and Hall felt the real future lay in a radial engine design. 
Without exception, the Warner-powered Sportster series brought favorable comments from their owners regarding handling and performance. Zanford Granville was always thinking of ways to improve his planes and thought a two-seat version of the popular Sportster might appeal to the commercial buyer with a need for high-speed transport. The new ship was designed to handle a range of radial engines, and the first plane was fit a big 450 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine. Designated the Model Y, the first senior sports to prove to be everything Granny hoped for. The powerful two-seater was painted white with bright red trim. One pilot who was attracted to this superb ship was Maud Tate, daughter of James, one of the brothers who owned Springfield Airport. Maud was the first woman in all of New England to hold a transport license. And in 1929, flying an autogyro, she set an unofficial altitude record for women of 16,500 feet. Maud loved to fly. She was soon drawn from her teaching job in nearby East Long Meadow to fly full time. The depression dragged on. Money remained scarce. To keep the business alive, Granny and Bob Hall began eyeing the prize money being offered at America's biggest aerial show, the National Air Races, coming up in Cleveland in just a few months. It was a, it's quite a lot of money, the National Air Races, and Granny and Bob Hall, between them, decided we ought to have some of it. So, actually, when it was really decided to build the city of Springfield, we only had a little over two months before the race. As good as the sportsters were, Granny and Hall both felt something different was needed. What came off the drawing boards was the Model Z, designed to excel at one job, go fast and win races. The Z carried through the radial engine design of the successful senior sportster. The setback cockpit created an optical illusion and many critics claimed the fuselage was too short for good control and that the tail surfaces were too small. The wings used a relatively new airfoil designed by an aeronautical engineer named Monk who published his theories in a series of articles in Aero Digest magazine in the early 30s. Hall chose a thinned reflex design which limited the travel of the center of lift as the wing passed through the air at various angles of attack. This also allowed the use of minimum tail surfaces to reduce weight and drag. The same airfoil design elements are used to a degree on the French British Con and most Delta Wing aircraft today. With only six weeks before the race and money tight, everyone plunged into the project with enthusiasm. For the engine, Bob Hall drew on his contacts at Pratt & Whitney, at that time a small engine manufacturer in nearby Hartford. Pratt & Whitney was impressed with Hall's ideas. They were also eager to publicize their engines and in the spirit of cooperation for their mutual benefit, agreed to loan the Granvilles a supercharged Wasp Junior engine. This was a Wasp Junior, or often known as the R985, an engine normally at that time of 300 horsepower, but which was allowed to go to 535 horsepower. Pratt & Whitney would grow into a world leader in aircraft engines over the coming years. During World War II, they would provide over 50% of the power for Allied air forces around the globe. Money was still needed to run the business, and Bob Hall and Granny formed what was called the Springfield Air Racing Association. The plan was to raise money from businessmen, private investors in the Springfield area. You see, when uh, the Springfield Air Racing Association had to be formed in order to raise money to build this airplane. I'd design the airplane in the morning and go out in the afternoon and pound the pavement to all the big companies in Springfield and say, hey, come on, buy some shares, 100 bucks a share and sold about $5,000 worth, which was enough to build this airplane. And the reason it was enough is because we got so much from 
the manufacturers without having to pay for it, like the engine. Pratt & Whitney lent us the engine. Curtis Propeller built us a special propeller, absolutely custom designed and built for this airplane. No charge. We got the wheels, tires, brakes, flying wires, some of the instruments, all for nothing, without which we couldn't possibly have have done it for the money that we were able to raise by the Springfield Air Racing Association. In six short weeks, the Model Z was completed. The little black and yellow ship, christened the City of Springfield, was ready for its maiden flight. Saturday, August 22nd, 1931. It was Bob Hall's 26th birthday. The plan was to take off from Springfield and land at nearby Bowles Field, just across the Connecticut River. Hall wasn't sure about the plane's landing speed, and to be safe, he wanted to use Bowles' longer runway. I didn't go very fast, you know. I didn't uh, push it one bit the first flight. Uh, all I wanted to do was to get it in the air and get it back on the ground, safely. So I didn't open it up at all, I think, what uh, somebody said. It was like a, what, 150, 175 miles an hour is all the fast I went on that first flight. But I flew it long enough so that I knew it was perfectly all right and uh, went over to Bold Field and landed it. And then we started uh, finding out a few things that were, had to be fixed a little bit. And I thought it was a fine flying airplane. I just, I really had no... No problems with it at all whatsoever. It, of course, it was very light on the. It was light on the rudder. In order to feel it, I flew in my stock and feet after the first flight. The Thompson Trophy race, the premier event of the national air races in Cleveland, was just days away. It was a 100-mile dash around pylons for aircraft of unlimited engine size. Bob Hall took off for Cleveland by way of Buffalo, where he and Lowell Bales would take turns flying the Z in the races over Labor Day. Bales had invested $500 to help build the Z in return for the right to fly it in the Thompson Trophy race. It was an exciting time for the Granvilles. It was very exciting. When, uh, when we got there, the we had two airplanes with about two feet of wing cut off of them, which we had to get flying. And we had, of course, we had a few men there before I got there. Mark and Ed, I guess, were both there. And Hall had, uh, in one of the races, Hall had clipped a, a water tower and took about three feet off the end of the senior wing, which had to be repaired overnight. And this, almost the same thing happened to one of the sportsters when somebody taxes into it. How did the, this stubby little plane of unusual design that made every military aircraft in the world obsolete the moment it took off? A lot of people didn't believe that a low-wing airplane could, could take a tight pylon turn, and they, they figured the biplanes would have a big advantage on that, and everybody thought Doolittle would probably win the race. And it's possible he, he might have had he had in trouble. They were they were very close on speed. Doolittle had a good ship, there's no doubt about that, and he's a great pilot. Jimmy Doolittle was just one of many who took part in the 1931 races, whose lives would be brought together in a more intense competition of global dimensions, World War II. Jimmy Doolittle would lead the raid on Tokyo and bolster Allied morale in the early days of the war. Bob Hall would test fly and contribute significantly to the design of some of the best fighter planes for our Navy. General Ira Eka, who, among other aviation achievements, would head up the U.S. 8th Air Force in England during World War II. And there was German aerobatic performer and World War I ace Ernst Udet, who would become known as the father of the Luftwaffe, Germany's force. At Cleveland, the Z caught Udette's eye, and he expressed his admiration of the little plane to Bob Hall in a rather unusual way. Udette never fully accepted Hitler's image of the new world order, and would fall into disfavor with the German government and commit suicide shortly after the war began.
The performance of the Model Z was nothing short of sensational. In each of the five races it was entered in, the little black and yellow ship walked away from the pack to take the checkered flag. In the straightaway Shell Speed Dash, sponsored by Shell Oil, Bales set a new American speed record of 267.34 miles an hour. Then, with the Thompson Trophy race just hours away, engine trouble developed. The uh, NEA set up that particular morning, which was the same day the Thompson was going to be flown, for him to run his attempt at the world speed record, which okay, was a very poor day to do it. And uh, he, uh, he, he flew several laps at full throttle, and he had motor trouble and had to land, and he, he brought it with him. He had two, at least one, I think two good mechanics there, and, and uh, my brother Mark and those boys from Pratt Whitney went right to work on it, tear it down, and uh, they had at least one cylinder and uh, two or three pistons that were ruined. And they had to change those right before race time? Right before the race. It was happened about 10 o'clock in the morning. The race come off, I don't know exactly, 2 or 3 in the afternoon. They, uh, Pratt Whitney had the material they had to fix it with, and had some good men, and they put it back together, and they fired her up about noontime, and Mark sat right in the cockpit and run that thing in from the time that it was ready to, to start until Bales got into it to wheel it out on yeah. the field. Yeah, I've read that. They never shut her down. After never they put the new down. pistons in, they never shut her down until Bales left the starting line. And Bales said she picked up revs every single lap all the way through the race. No problems, whatever. Entourage made out well at the 1931 National Air Races. The Model Z won five races in all. Meanwhile, Bob Hall finished fourth in the Thompson Trophy race in the Model Y. Maud Tate set a new ladies' speed record in the Model Y by winning the Aero Trophy, the premier event for women pilots. Another grand achievement for one of the country's outstanding aviatrix. Springfield went wild as their heroes came home. <laughs> it sure did. They cleaned uh, up in it. I, I forgot exactly, but I think it was up around $17,000 in all. And uh, had the senior sports to load the front cockpit full of trophies <laughs> when he came home to Springfield with them. Yeah, it really was a big thing for a little outfit. I remember it very distinctly. The airplanes all come in and there was a mob, a mob at Springfield Airport and then the city put on a banquet that night it was really big doings. Everybody that was able to made a speech. Granny, Granny made a pretty good speech, given the, the boys who worked their heads off to get the airplane built in time. On a practical note, the more than $17,000 of prize money, a very tidy sum in the 1930s, assured Granville Brothers' aircraft would remain in business. It also meant a 100% dividend paid to the jubilant investors of the Springfield Air Racing Association. In spite of the GB success, no one had money to buy airplanes. In order to keep busy, Granny took the opportunity to explore several design concepts. One of them was a canard, or tail-first design. Granny's design was influenced by Germany's Focke-Wulf, Ante, a twin-engine canard with tricycle landing gear. He dubbed his version the Ascender, notable as a very rare example of an American design of this type during the period. A design concept that's being explored in great depth today. With business slack and no end to their money problems, Bob Hall decided to go on his own. He left the Granvilles to form his own company just across the river at Bowles Airport in Agawam, Massachusetts. Bob was an ambitious young man and a very capable young man, and he would go on his own and do the things that he wanted to do. They, he and Granny didn't always 
want to do the same things and so it was just a matter of two smart young fellows separating and going on their own. Bob Hall designed and built two planes for wealthy sportsman pilots and flew his Springfield Bulldog in the 1932 National Air Races but finished just out of the money. Hall would go on to Grumman to work as an engineering test pilot. His influence on the design of the Wildcat, Hellcat and Avenger planes that distinguished themselves during World War II can be traced to his experience with the GB racers. Hall retired from Grumman as Vice President of Engineering in 1970. Lowell Bales became ambitious and decided that he would try for the new world land plane speed record which was held by France. Pratt & Whitney cooperated by lending Granville's or the Springfield Air Race Association Incorporated a 750 horsepower engine which went into the Model Z. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, I remember uh, we put it in and uh, and after his test stop, Granny, who always was a very conservative man, he asked Lowell to take it up well up and find out whether whether it could take the beating or not before he'd done any racing with it or made any world speed. And Bales took it and was gone for a couple of hours and he come back all smiles and he said, she'll hold together, you don't have to worry a bit about that. Maud Tate also decided to try for the women's record in the Model Y. I uh, wasn't fortunate enough to break it by enough to a record. I missed it by a very, very tiny bit. Who held the record at that time? Amelia Earhart. Maud Tate missed establishing a new women's record by just one one hundredth of a second. Discouraged and pressed to return for her upcoming wedding, Maud dropped out of the trials. Period. Bales flew the required four passes over the timed course. On one of these passes, he was clocked at 314 miles per hour. However, on another of the official runs, the timing equipment on the ground malfunctioned and his speed could not be officially recorded. Another attempt at the record. Extremely turbulent the afternoon of his bailed up for record heat runs. To his discomfort were dangerously outdated regulation, limiting speed runs to below 50 meters, 164 feet. Acceptable perhaps for earlier times, but not for the faster air. Just approaching the, the marker when she seemed to explode and there was one it, uh, a wing collapsed and uh, it made four complete snap rolls so fast that nobody could see them with the naked eye. It, it hit right in the middle of the feed. The engine come out of it, rolled just like a wheel, the whole length of feet. His body and uh, it was just a flaming mass. They, they had a movie camera set up at that pylon, and they had taken beautiful pictures of it. They had clear pictures, and, and Granny run those pictures over and over and over, trying to find out what it was. Granny feared that the gas came loose and hit the windshield, blinding bales and causing him to lose control. Another widely held theory at the time, however, was that there must have been a fracture or other stress related that was the fear of the right wing due to low altitude turbulence. And there's been a lot of people said that that Granny only only cared about speed and had no thought for the safety of but that was totally a fabrication because nobody ever tried harder to build an airplane that a one year granny did. 
Axis triggered what was to become a series of generally inaccurate articles bent on sensationalizing the event and other mishaps the GBs experienced as time went on. Of course, says, oh, the airplane's bad airplane, crashed, you know, somebody got killed. They don't do the facts, unfortunately. The I think these yeah, have an unfair reputation. Mm. This literary misconduct was criticized by Walter Boyne, former director of the National Air and Space Museum, wrote, The Model Z snapped over and smashed into the ground a row of flame and generations act journalists, teeth to embroider. Crushed by the loss of a close personal friend, Zanford... At about the same time, an Aaron and Howell Pete Miller joined the Granville brothers. Granny worked with Pete as he had two vision on the Team 32 pieces, one but two new ships based on broad refinements of the Model Z design. Both planes, the R1 was intended strictly for pylon racing engines. The R2, with a smaller engine and greater fuel capacity, was toward the Benz distance of the day, still favored the sleek, narrow fuselage of the inline design. Miller carried through the B, molding the fuselage around the big Pratt & Whitney water, closing them in a cowling, designed to enhance cooling and reduce drag. He adapted the teardrop in soon to lower drag. Maximum diameter was at about one-third of the length of the body. The efficiency of the concept was later confirmed in wind tunnel. Well, I think all of the people in the race were at Granville's. Uh, their airplanes were re-engineered. Yes, uh, I think uh, Granville's the real, Ed is the real designer. He's the one that laid it out in the design philosophy and so forth. But then there an engineering group such as Paul, Sick Miller, and the others who do the engineering. They were all strict analyzed, built wind models, and came down to New York first thing. They knew the characteristics of those planes. Yes, they were hot, fast airplanes, not made for Piper Cub pilots. The fuselage was constructed of aircraft steel timbers and spruce stringers. The fin and rudder was another deviation from accepted practice. The rudder of inches thick hinge line provided at stall speed and a soft feel at high speeds. The cockpit was placed just ahead of the aircraft boats and streamlining. But were provided. A piece cockpit cover and a small door in the side of the fuselage. Another innovation was the using tailwheel in place of a skid. Pete Miller respected Lee Gelbach's opinions and incorporated men's regarding the control characteristics of the ARBs. Longton's flyer Russell Boardman controlling interest in the Springfield Air Racing Association decided to have the honor of playing number 11. The airplane was ready, Boardman was ready, and he was a very cool customer. He went out and stood with his parachute now 11. The news people take this and get excited about flying, isn't he flying a cub? And he took it off, perfect flow at the Buffy landed. And the airplane, the only thing he said that it, and it, and and and, and uh, he beat, decided immediately to to uh, on board was flown again. We uh, we did that job right at right in the hangar and bowls, and then the one had he had it spilled, and the job was done. Came out of the shop. I was uh, at bowls finishing Taylor, and was told that when it was right back there, which I did, had to drop the thing. We fly it as soon as it was ready. And Boardman had his car there, and the uh, rival was. Granny said, you take the Sportster and go that. Boardman took off in the Sportster and gradually steep angle. He fell into a spin at an altitude too low and crashed into the woods just off the boundary. Severe crash was attributed to habit of abrupt pull-ups on takeoff, a practice that was later. He was quite a few able to fly again. Why well, didn't kill him? Nobody knows. He went right down through into the woods, into the ground. Children of it and MIT Aeronautical Engineering grad Julius Race, a layered solution fitted with a newly installed retractable landing gear. The gear mouth the plane was damaged, one of the world's best without plane. Halfway across the country, fast plane, the GB, with no pilot. When he was able to talk, Randy went down to his home, down on the camp, a couple of them, and they apparently talked to Sid over and uh, to find out what who we wanted to get for. I don't think.
think up time they did for number seven. They come up the Lee Gell back and and a little. He flew into Springfield first and picked up Grant and Mark and, and they flew over the bowl with William and they went over the apple for an hour old between them and then do he just off and, and waited to hear. Less than two hours later, we got a telegram from him, and it's a few words. It said, landed Cleveland, okay. And that's all it's Doolittle handling the R1. Granny could mention to the league that successfully competed in the 1931 Bendix. Would he fly for the Granvilles in 1932? Was he originated in Brick coordinated with the national air races, by being in Cleveland. The pilots enter additional events. Gelbach made R2 from Springfield, Massachusetts to the West Coast without incest to Cleveland. He was all on his own here with number seven. And uh, back, I was uh, doing very slowly and figured on winning it. And somewhere over, he began to spray all on his windshield. And uh, he sat down at the arm and they, he found he had, a, he had oil line. There was no facilities for fixing it. Oh. And uh, he got the cockpit were off off again and went on Cleveland. The airplane all the way, Gelbach and the R2 dropped out of commission and were the last of the best entries to arrive in Cleveland. Now the Granvilles turned their attention to the Shell Dash, qualifying of a coming feature, the Tom Sophie race. at 296 miles per hour, miles per hour faster than his closest challenge. His win to America from France, which held the record as eights, earned Doolittle the sum of $505. He also won the Lowell Bales Mummel Trophy, awarded to Ayers Seven Plane Speaker. Now, it was on to the main event, the race speed. The big GBs waited starting line. Three Waddell Williams ships with a real competition close to speed. Some everything except Bullet had enough more speed over everybody, so that he flew off and kept out of the mess. Uh, won very easy. Real the real battle between Jack and Huff, the wind Gelback real rest down low to the ground. Got every every drop does up. Do little the Thompson Enflers, hands down, knocking it over 32 miles per hour. Another new record. Lee Gelba finished fifth in the year two and pocketed her dollars. Jim Little's dub says Springfield in the GB. Announced at the time, this was to be Doolittle's last race. This shows the city that was built into these classic airplanes. Because of conflict runway traffic, Doolittle is shown in the R landing attempt. While at low speed, with ease. Extensive wind tunnel to get that the aircraft was completely stable at all speeds at the his magnificent genes. Doolittle heaped praise on the Granville Brothers aircraft, summing personal Fina note as Anford a few days after the Nash races. Dear Granny, just a note to tell you that the big G Funky and the Speed Dot was for your continued success. I am as for him. And so the high point of the 1930 aviation year came with the GBs pushing their country to the world aviation. It all closed it during the G craft gray sky without being hounded for fortune.
and a series of unfortunate accidents caused by experience in high puff craft. Death knell came, 34, delivering a sportster to a client landing at Pittsburgh, South Carolina. Granny and was killed as he pulled to avoid hit airport who had won. That sealed the of Granville Brothers aircraft and also signaled the end of an aviation history. Moby story gone. Field Airport is no longer by a shopping. And yet, around the presence of the bees in the commercial, the engineer bees is an intric of the aircraft day. The best, because really gratifying people to what to do was design airplanes, and I had no interference. And a very great leader, and I'm just. Years with the Grand Blue Brothers.